Welcome to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. My name is Carol Allman Morton. And we're going to begin with a land acknowledgement for where we are, where many of us are in the Berkshires, and then a few short announcements, and then off we go. As we begin with gratitude and humility, we acknowledge that those of us in the Berkshires are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, or the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. You can learn more about programming at Ollie at BCC at our website, berkshireollie.org. And if you would like to see our calendar, calendar of events, it's berkshireollie.org forward slash events. I encourage you to watch out for your Friday email and if you're registered for this program, you'll receive it, uh, which will include updated information on workshops and special events. In particular, I wanna highlight that tickets for the Mona Sherman Memorial Lecture with Ari Melber will be available starting at 9 a.m. this Thursday for all of members. And the link uh, to get more ticket information is going in the chat momentarily. I also wanna highlight that summer courses will begin in June and information should be available uh, regarding classes in early May. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to Catherine Kidd to introduce our speaker tonight. Hey, thank you very much, Carol. Um, I'm Catherine Kidd, and I chair the Curriculum Council uh, here at uh, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. And it is my pleasure to introduce Jim Brooke to those of you who uh, have not been on the prior sessions. For the last two years, uh, we have had the great good fortune of having Jim uh, do presentations for us, updates on what is happening on the war in Ukraine, uh, about every 100 to 120 days. Uh, Jim is uh, a resident of the Berkshires. He grew up here, but left uh, to go to college and graduate school uh, and to serve as a journalist overseas. Uh, where he spent uh, a good deal of time uh, both in Russia uh, with Voice of America, um, with the New York Times, with Bloomberg, and then uh, for uh, the last few years before returning to the U.S. in Kiev, uh, where he uh, had an independent and still has uh, an independent um, business uh, publication. Uh, Jim is um, very, very well informed about what is happening uh, in uh, the war in Ukraine and in Ukraine and Russia generally. Uh, if you live in the Berkshires and are a subscriber to the Berkshire Eagle, uh, you can be watching out for Jim's articles, um, which appear regularly in the Eagle uh, not just on Ukraine, although mostly on Ukraine, but also on some other foreign policy issues. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Jim back uh, for this uh, update, which I think is happening at a very important moment um, in the conflict in Ukraine and dealing with uh, political issues um, within our own uh system. So take it away, Jim. Great. Oh, and I apologize. Nobody mentioned, uh, if you have questions for Jim, uh, please put them in the chat. And uh, then uh, I will uh, share them with Jim at the end of his time. Excellent. Great, Catherine. Thank you. And um, yes, I had an article in today's Eagle about uh, drone war for warfare out of Ukraine. And thank you for promoting me to having gone to grad school. I never actually did. I, my grad school was running around and being a reporter covering cops in Washington, DC. Um, today, I'd like to introduce a, a theme, which is asymmetrical, asymmetrical. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this call, many of us remember the Vietnam War. Uh, Americans, starting with the French, the French Empire had a very low view of the um, Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese. Uh, that ended in Dien Bien Phu in 1954. 
20 years later, it was our turn, uh, the fall of Saigon in 1974. And about 15 years later, it was the Soviet turn, the turn of the Soviet empire uh, failing in Afghanistan. Um, I'm just saying that on paper, Russia looks pretty in, in, impressive and pregnable. You know, it's got three times the population of Ukraine. It's got 10 times the economy because it's a big oil um, exporter. But uh, I would, I don't, I'm not putting my money on Russia. Let's put it that way. Um, so the big difference as in Vietnam, as in Afghanistan is the Ukrainians care and the empires, soldiers, the Russians simply do not. Um, there's a lot of shrill stuff on the state control TV in, in Russia. <clears throat> But uh, I think the, the Russian public is somewhat indifferent to this war, uh, keeping their head down, hoping it'll be over as soon as possible. And their, their heart is not into it. The Ukrainian heart is into it. What I like to do for simplicity's sake is look at the war, sea, air, and land. Uh, let's start with the sea. That's a pretty easy one. In the last two years, uh, the Ukrainians have sunk one third of the Black Sea fleet. Uh, and they've done this without a Navy. Their Navy is basically what they call sea babies, which are um, basically like a motorboat you might see on Noda Lake or somewhere without the pilot. These are kamikaze drones. Uh, they can go 500 miles. And instead of a pilot, you have um, maybe a ton of TNT in the bow and it's teleguided uh, by GPS and remote control. Uh, this pretty simple technology has managed to sink, as I said, uh, the flagship of the Russian Navy in the Black Sea and, um, and a third of the ships. The What's a concrete result? The concrete result is there will not be a Russian amphibious landing on the low flat shores around Odessa. Uh, the Russians quietly, surreptitiously brought in about 10 landing ships um, uh, before they started the war. They said they were there for exercises. Um, most of these landing ships are in the bottom and Ukraine is going to offer scuba diving classes and courses and tours to look at the Russian Black Sea fleet um, at the bottom of the Black Sea. Um, the other concrete result is the Russian Navy has been pushed out of the Western Black Sea, which means that uh, without Russia's permission, the grain cargoes are coming and going almost normally. And the first container ship left Odessa last week. Um, as a result, food inflation, which spiked during the war, is back down to pre-war levels. And this isn't because Russia is being nice, it's because Russia has lost control of the Central and Western Black Sea. If you want to take the long view, it's the first time since Catherine the Great of Potemkin in 1783 that Russia no longer controls the Black Sea. And once again, this is done by a country without a navy. So you can bet that our navy, in the form of Annapolis and the Navy War College, are studying very, very carefully how uh, Ukraine is pulling us off. Uh, if we get one of our fleets pulled into defending Taiwan, how do we defend against uh, what are called sea drones and ship killing missiles? Um, the air is also unconventional. Um, last week, um, Ukrainian drones flew 800 miles um, east and hit the third largest refinery, oil refinery, and hit a drone factory, which the Russians had deliberately taken us page out of Stalin's book had deliberately put their war factory as far east as convenient. Uh, it was happened to be in Tatar, Tatarstan. Um, these are more than drones. They're in the Western press calls them Cessna, but the Ukrainians make their own small planes. They're called fox bats. And once again, instead of having like in the kamikaze era of the zero uh, jets and or fighter bombs of the um, Japanese war, World War II, uh, there's no pilot. Uh, instead of a pilot, you've got TNT, and they, they pack a pretty good punch. Going 800 miles east uh, is a big ticket. Last week, uh, the best-selling newspaper in Europe, Bild, uh, the German newspaper, 
reported that the Ukrainians are building 1,000 drones that can go up to 1,300 miles. That puts uh, 40 Russian military bases within range of the Ukrainian border. Uh, that is the distance of flying from Montreal to Miami. It's a long haul. Uh, they do it slowly. But as Matthias Rust showed in 1987, you can fly a Cessna and land on Red Square. Russia is the biggest country in the world. It's very hard to defend 40 air bases, uh, which are spread all over the place. Um, so this is a real game changer. And we saw Friday night, um, the, the Ukrainians sent in probably about 100 drones in waves to attack three Russian air bases uh, fairly near the border, probably within two, 300 miles of the border. And they were trying to take out these um, Suhoi fighter bombers. The Russians are, they've got a great advantage of what we call glide bombs. They're, they're retrofitting bomb, dumb bombs, putting little winglets on them and putting in some sort of GPS. And they've done incredible damage to the land forces in in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, Ukraine is going to the source, which are these air bases where the Sohoys are parked. And a couple of Tupolyovs said the Engels two air base. I mean, only in Russia where they name an air base out of Marx, Lenin, and Engels. But um, so this is a game changer. Once again, you can bet the Pentagon is studying this very closely. On the smaller drones, um, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, has promised to build one million drones this year. Uh, according to the Kyiv government, at any given moment, there are 3,000 drones in the air. And the front line is 600 miles. So that means maybe uh, five drones per mile. And uh, if you look at like the Pitsu Lennox Road, seven miles, it'd be 35 drones orbiting around. It's a new kind of warfare. It's the first drone serious war in, in the history of mankind. Um, and you can see plenty of these depressing, basically snuff videos where drones will chase a Russian soldier as he scurries around a tank looking for cover and then take him out. Um, these things are all over the internet. And frankly, the, the Ukrainians want more artillery shells and want more rockets, but these drones are just taking out 10, 20 Russian tanks a day. Uh, and on the land, we believe the Russians, the Ukrainians claim that the Russians are losing seven to 800 soldiers a day. Um, Russia is approaching, probably this weekend, Russia will approach the 450,000 dead and wounded. Wounded by meaning maimed, because many wounded are pushed, pushed back into the front line, but maimed means often amputated. Um, this is six times what <clears throat> the uh, Soviets lost in 10 years in Afghanistan. So in two years, Putin's burned through almost half a million people um, with a population that is half that of the Soviet Union. You know, when the Soviet Union fell apart, they lost Central Asia, they lost Ukraine, they lost the Baltics. And the Soviet population was double that of current um, Russia. And if I don't step on anyone's toes, the demographics of Russia is a little bit like Lenox, Massachusetts. There's kind of a shortage of 18 year old men. There just aren't that many. And so this is gonna be amazingly traumatic for the Russian people when they wake up to these incredible losses. Uh, British intelligence predicts that by the end of this year, uh, Russia will have lost 500,000, half a million. Apparently they're already at 450 and they're, they're clicking right along. So. Um, it's, um, that I think is the, the elephant in the living room for Vladimir Putin. And that's why he has blocked 125,000 websites. You, you can't read Voice of America, Radio for Europe, New York Times, Radio France Internationale, Deutsche Welle in Russia, unless you have a VPN and surprise, surprise, Russia was the champion in 2022 for downloading VPNs because people wanted to get a sense of what's going on. Um, the All these bombings, uh, they've hit 15 refineries. Um, 
Russia's lost 15% of its refining capacity. Russia is now, it's stopped exports of gasoline. It's importing gasoline from Belarus and has talked to Kazakhstan about importing gasoline. This is having a real impact. And um, Biden administration officials basically asked the Ukrainians to cool it because the Biden administration concern is high gasoline prices during the summer driving season leading up to the November election. So um, the Ukrainians sort of listened and, and redirected their drones to military targets, military factories, uh, but they did attack another, uh, you know, the third largest refinery in the country a few days ago. Um, this is having a pretty strong psychological impact inside Russia. Um, it's basically bringing the war home. St. Petersburg, all the big, what they call Milioniki, the, the cities of over a million people have been hit by these drones. There have been columns of smoke going up. They can't be denied and, and wished away. And um, these are showing the Russians that there is a war going on and it's getting, they are paying a price for it. Um, Ukraine has run roughshod over Vladimir Putin's uh, red lines. Uh, they, they bomb Crimea almost on a daily basis. They sent in Russian exile partisan units into uh, the region of Belgorod, Kur Kursk, and, um, and a bit of Rostov. So the war has spilled over into Western Russia. And um, Putin huffed and puffed to the outset of the war, made a lot of nuclear threats, but basically uh, his reaction is to ignore this um, and to, um, to gin up national sentiment. You probably read about the horrible attack um, at Crocus City in Moscow, the concert hall, which actually is the only time I've ever seen Donald Trump was the Miss Universe contest of 2013, I think. And um, um, and he was there and uh, and it's a nice hall. It got burned out. We didn't know that apparently, now we know that apparently he was, since he owned the Miss Universe contest, he was kind of peeking over the dividers where the women were changing their clothes. But um, <laughs> some people never grow up. Um, so the Crocus City attack killed about 145, wounded 550, and there were 95 missing because once again, Russia kind of ignores fire safety. So three of the four fire exits were padlocked. The sprinklers didn't work. A lot of people burned to death and the roof came down. Um, so about 800 killed and wounded. Um, it's a huge shock. He was in the media capital of the country. Um, and so Putin from day one insinuated, and now he's moved beyond insinuating, blaming it on Ukraine. And then he blames it on us, the Western Washington puppet masters of the Ukrainians. So he's trying to use this to gin up, um, uh, you know, support for his war. Uh, while the four perpetrators were still on the loose, ISIS Afghanistan claimed credit, so-called credit for this. And then while the, the next morning, while the hall was still burning, they uh, put a, posted a video of um, one of the men shooting people and shouting Allah Akbar and death to the infidels, this sort of thing. So obviously while the guys were driving away, they, they posted some of their video. So there isn't much doubt that ISIS of Afghanistan pulled this off. Um, the US and Iran had warned the Russians that ISIS was going to attack. Um, two weeks before the US actually warned that it could be well be Crocus City Music Hall, a concert hall. Um, so, uh, but you know, the big lie works and by a whole slew of Kremlin notables have been blaming Ukraine and a poll was taken last week and 50% of Russians believe that it was Ukraine with the Western puppeteers that attacked the, the hall. Um, and to some degree, enlistments have spiked. Um, I think they got an extra 15,000 men to sign up. Um, so 
Putin is using that to his advantage, obviously. Um, going back to um, where we are, we'll go back to the air war. Um, we've got a sl slew of European countries, Belgium, Holland, Norway are giving Ukraine F-16s. So Ukraine will have an air force starting this summer again. Um, but once again, they, everything they've been doing is basically without an air force. What air force they had has been taken out by now. Um, one one thing I'd like to stress about the Ukrainian ingenuity, uh, apparently they've posted 8,000 cell phones on poles um, around the edge of Ukraine. And this serves as an early warning system for these fairly noisy drones that come in at about 100 miles an hour, the Iranian-made uh, Shadeds. And, um, I just cite that it's not high tech, but apparently it works and they end up shooting down about 90% of these things that come in, the Shadeds. And we've learned a lot. You know, once again, the Pentagon is studying us very closely. We've learned that a Patriot can take down a Kinjal dagger hypersonic missile, that a, a Zircon missile, which travels nine times the, the speed of sound, uh, has been taken down by a Patriot. Uh, this is not the kind of stuff that we can test out in New Mexico. Um, so the US, we're learning a lot about the capabilities of our missiles. And unfortunately, we're learning the capabilities of the North Korean missiles because they've sent a lot to you, um, to Russia. Um, we all are watching, um, we're watching the American political scene and you probably caught uh, President Trump's remarks where he kind of egged on the Russians who, attack any country that isn't paying their 2% of GDP for defense. Um, that obviously was pretty negative for um, for Europe. Uh, NATO has worked on 70, they just had their 75th birthday uh, last week. For 75 years, NATO has worked partly on the bluff and the psychological element. And when you have the leader of the Western world saying, come on in, the psychological element is popped like a balloon. Um, that scared a lot of people in Europe. We're seeing a lot of action on the European side. So now, of course, Trump can claim credit for that. But <clears throat> there's a growing realization in Europe, even before Trump's most recent comments, that uh, Russia <clears throat> has sort of come out of hibernation and is a real threat to Europe. We've seen this with... Um, uh, Finland abandoning 75 years of neutrality and, and joining NATO last year. Uh, last month, it was Sweden abandoning 200 years of neutrality, joining NATO. Um, thanks to Putin's aggression in Ukraine, the Baltic has become a NATO sea, um, which it was not before. Um, so that that is happening with the Nordics. And I just Norway, I mean, I can list so many countries that are really taking concrete action. Norway is doubling its defense spending over the next decade. And the government sent to parliament a letter saying, we must expect that Norway will live with a more dangerous and unpredictable Russia for many years. The relationship with Russia will be for a long time to come will be demanding and in many ways defining for Norwegian security and defense policy. So um, Norway shares a small land border with Russia. Norway shares a lot of water with Russia. Um, that's an example of a case of a mid-sized power in Europe that's really moved. Um, as we speak, Portugal is negotiating a 10-year security pact with Ukraine you can say, well, so what? Well, it's the ninth NATO country that has negotiated in the last two months a 10-year security pact with Ukraine. I bring this up to show you how the Europeans are lining up because they see Russia as a real threat. Um, Poland, Poland is building NATO's largest land army, a one million man and woman army. Uh, Poland, the goal in NATO is to spend 2% of GDP for military. Poland is spending 4%. A poll 
poll of polls, P-O-L-E-S, found that um, 60% believe it is likely that they will be attacked by Russia uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, th that concern, I don't think it's kind of penetrated among many Americans, but um, the Eastern Europeans are very concerned. Uh, the, the president of the Czech Republic, Piotr Pavel, has um, openly said uh, that uh, Ukraine is going could be the next Sudetenland. You may recall that uh, the Czechs in 1938 allowed Nazi Germany to take over this largely German-speaking Western province. And in return, and I've got the quote, Adolf Hitler said that it would be the last territorial demand I will make in Europe. That was in 1938. So um, the Czechs feel quite uneasy about what's happening with, with Russia. Uh, last summer, Pavel, at an anniversary of the Prague Spring of 1968, Pavel said, Russia has not changed. The 1968 invasion was a time of lost dreams and lost dignity. We should remember what it felt like because Ukraine only wants what we wanted at that time. They wanted to determine their own path. Russia hasn't changed since then. The country has a different name, but its foreign policy, its values, are the same. And Pavel has organized on a sort of no-names basis. He has um, raised one million artillery shells for Ukraine. Um, these are standard shells that um, are in arsenals around the world. And um, he's leading his campaign to buy them. Now, where are we? Um, I, I just don't know what's going on with Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, um, of representatives. Um, there is some version that he will allow Ukraine aid, which is supported by a majority of the House of Representatives. He will allow a bill that would, because he's from Louisiana, take off the Biden pause on natural gas. They would convert the aid into a lend lease, which is what we did with Britain and the uh, Soviet Union in 1940, and would... Uh, use frozen Russian funds uh, to pay for some of this. Uh, you know, the Senate said, well, we've already passed legislation. This sounds like a whole new rewrite. Uh, I'm not that confident that it'll get through. Uh, he may just be buying time. Uh, he did promise to do this after Easter, but we're now after Easter. I'm not seeing a lot of action. Um, Putin, on the other hand, has put his country on a war footing. Uh, he has basically rubbed out his leading military opponent, uh, which was um, Prigozhin, who he blew up the plane last August with the mercenary leadership aboard. And then he killed um, Navalny, Alexander Navalny, a man I interviewed several times in Moscow. Uh, he killed him uh, at the end of February. And Navalny, you know, you might think, oh, well, too bad. Well, Navalny really was the hope of the Russians under 40. Uh, and he was a very good marketer and very charismatic and had this uh, squeaky clean life with a beautiful wife and photogenic children. His daughter's at Stanford, by the way. Um, and he, uh, he would produce these videos denouncing the total corruption of the Russian system. They'd be watched by 50 million people, which is a lot in a country of 140 million people. So he had a lot of influence. He was not a Mr. Nobody. And, and he was the hope of the Russian Russia's future. I think he agreed to return to Russia and be automatically thrown in prison because he thought he would be a Rush, Russian Nelson Mandela, that he'd spend five, 10 years in some horrible prison somewhere, and then he would come out. Uh, well, Putin didn't uh, want to run that risk. And so um, that's pretty dispiriting. I have no idea what, what the, will happen there. Um, Putin has the country on war footing. Um, he probably, he's just announced 150,000 men, uh, sort of the regular spring call up. Um, 
under the Russian constitution, ha ha ha, uh, these men are not supposed to be sent into combat. They're just conscripts, but they have been and they will be. Uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, believes that he's going to call up another 150,000 and that he will launch a offensive starting in May, um, a spring summer offensive. Um, and he's being very aggressive to the West. Uh, his latest comment was that um, if the Ukrainian F-16s take off from NATO bases, those bases can be attacked by his forces. So we're talking about a potential of a Russia NATO. Now, he's very good at brinkmanship and will go to the edge many, many times. Um, so once again, um, the feeling in, I mean, Zelensky, and he has an axe to grind, of course, is that uh, he told CBS last week, for Putin, we are a satellite of the Russian Federation. At, for now, it's us, then Kazakhstan, then the Baltics, then Poland, then Germany, or at least the eastern half of Germany. So that's how Zelensky sees it. But, and I read the literature, Poles, Danes, and Germans, I'm talking about their defense ministers, are saying that Putin is preparing to attack another NATO nation in two to five years. Um, I'm a little skeptical that the two-year part, because thanks to the Ukrainians, the uh, Russian army has been cut in half. Not just the men, but they've blown up over 7,000 tanks, um, 13,000 armored personnel carriers, and a similar number of artillery pieces. There are just so many of these things that are around, you know, uh, that they can get out of storage. Now, here's a clue. When you read that the Ukrainians have taken out a T-55 tank, uh, those the number is 55. Uh, like I was born in 1955. So I believe I still can pack a punch. But basically, he's fielding 69-year-old tanks, OK? Um, you know, not so great. Uh, we have drone footage of um, Russian soldiers scooting across a battlefield in a Chinese golf cart. We have two of those videos. And of course, they get hit by a drone. But if the men aren't in a golf cart because they like to run around golf carts, they're in a golf cart because Putin is running out of armored personnel carriers. Um, so the the future is going to be more fighting. Uh, Putin is obviously waiting for our election. Um, it doesn't take a paranoid conspiracy theorist to bet that uh, Putin will subtly interfere in our election. Um, I, I do believe that we will see high gas prices. And frankly, if gas goes from where it is now at three forty a gallon to five dollars a gallon in July and August, American voters are not going to be happy. And Putin may be able to pull that off by reducing production and exports. Um, I, I'm amazed at the the trolling uh, you've seen leading Republicans in the House complaining that there is a Putin wing of the Republican Party, um, and I am seeing an extraordinary number of YouTube videos that are very pro-Putin, pro-Russia, anti-Ukraine. And uh, they're not just, you know, the Hindustan Times, which is the Indian and sort of pro-Russian, but it's a lot of a deluge of YouTube videos coming out, which have the power for affecting uh, public opinion here and elsewhere. Um, I think uh, I'll leave you with, two, well, I'll stop with two points. One is, um, what is the European Union? Um, the European Union is a club of failed European empires, Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, Holland, Italy, Belgium. It was Britain, but Britain's out of the picture. So the European Union, they're now nation states. They look east, and increasingly people are looking at Russia as the last European empire. Now, it's a land empire. Much of it dates back 300 years. So that's a different kettle of fish. It's not like the Brits saying goodbye to Ghana and giving them 100,000 pounds for the new central bank. 
you know, the but there is a very strong secessionist separatist feeling in the fringe. Um, to run the war without upsetting the Muscovites and the St. Petersburgers, um, Putin targeted his draft on the ethnic minorities, the religious minorities, and the flyover country. So the three Buddhist republics, Tuva, Kalmykia, and Buratia, have been disproportionately hit. Uh, the Muslim areas in the south uh, and Saha and other places. Uh, a Russian exile uh, publication, Medusa, calculated that if you were a Buryat, you had from Buryatia, which borders Mongolia, you had 30 time, 32 times uh, greater chance of getting killed in Ukraine than a young man from Moscow. So basically, he spared Moscow and the Petersburg and the big cities and drilled into these areas. He's also um, heavily targeted the prisons uh, to the extent there are actually prison colonies that are closing for lack of clients. Um, and uh, maybe as many as half of Russian male prisoners, and it has a very high incarceration rate, have been basically drafted and sent to the front. Once again, something that Stalin did during uh, World War II with the famous Strafbots, the, the punishment battalions that were sort of sent forward as cannon fodder, often to draw fire so they could see where the fire was coming from. Um, but back to Russia is a federation of 82 units, and many of those are um, ethnic units, maybe a third or 40 percent. Uh, and this is going to be this is very tricky for um, for Russia. Um, we're seeing next week in Washington there'll be another one of these secessionist conferences, and um, you'll see a lot of unknown flags, places you've never heard of. Uh, that want to become independent, that have websites, that have liberation movements, that talk to each other. And the vibe is that when the center loses hold, when Moscow loses grip, they won't go out in what was called in the 1990s the parade of sovereignties. They will go out together. The five republics that want to go will declare independence at the same time. And, and that will be that. And, and Russia won't be able to put out all these fires. And, and Russia has been very successful uh, dominating the world's largest country by divide and rule and, and, and of course, repression. Um, so to be a futurologist, you have to start in the recent past, which is there have been several disintegrations of the Moscow-dominated space. There was something called Comic-Con, which was an economic bloc, which included Vietnam, Mongolia, and Cuba. That, of course, fell apart in 1991. The Warsaw Pact, which was our, the equivalent of NATO, that fell in 1991. And then of the 15 Soviet Socialist Republics, 14 peeled off, and Russia remained in the sort of rump state. Rump state with like, you know, 85% of the, the real estate. Um, so I would predict that in the next few years, um, if current trends hold up, there will be a, another peeling away from the edges of the Moscow dominated space. So Catherine, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to reach for a drink of Coca-Cola and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, we have a lot of questions, uh, and so I'm going to try to go through these um, um, in a in an orderly way. Um, and but um, we can still take more questions in the chat. So if questions come up uh, as Jim is answering the questions that are already there, please feel free uh, to add additional questions. Um, so um, uh, one question is, um, why isn't Russia bombing uh, Ukraine's drone factories? Why are we hearing about um, the- uh, they, they claim they did. If, uh, am I on mute? I'm on mute. 
Am I on mute? No, no, we can hear okay. you. Yeah, uh, they claim they did yesterday. Um, now, the Russians were very public about where this Iranian drone factory is going to be built in a special economic zone in Tartaboroga and east of the capital of Tartarstan. So everyone knew where it was. I mean, I could find it on the map within 15 seconds on Google. Um, the Ukrainian approach is very decentralized. Um, I think the the build reported there are 100 factories building these long range and long range is the Miami to Montreal ones. Um, so they don't advertise them. And, uh, and I did look up the company that makes Foxbat and all of a sudden they'd had somehow, well, they deleted their address from their website. <laughs> I'm sure the Russians know exactly where they are, but you know, they've kind of gone low profile. And if you do a Google for the name of the company, uh, you, you won't find it. Um, and, um, so I see my friend, Peter Homans is asking a question, watch out. he's the expert. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so actually we've gotten a lot of new questions here at the end. Uh, so, um, I hope we'll be able to get to those in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, so, um, there's a question here about, um, whether um, there is stronger Islamist sentiment um, either in the countries bordering Russia, the Central Asian republics, uh, or within the Muslim-dominated uh, caucus uh, republics. So uh, could you talk about that? And uh, is that connected to the um, ISIS-K attack uh, in Moscow? Yeah, um, there has been, and uh, Putin kind of came to power by fighting two bloody, or well, final bloody war against Chechnya, uh, which is one of the Muslim caucuses areas. I've been to Chechnya, I've been to Ingushetia, and, you know, it's like 99% Chechen and 99% English. All the Russians have been kind of expelled. There's one token Russian Orthodox church kind of plopped in the middle of Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. Um it was a huge problem in that with the collapse of Soviet Union, sort of the repressed but somewhat mellow version of Islam, which had sort of local holdovers from paganism and animism, whatever, that was kind of wiped out by these Wahhabi, these, these Saudi missionaries that came in and really preached a very hard line. And as a result, um, much of the rebellion was not just ethnic and regional, but it was religious. Um, if you you can look at these pictures in Moscow, like we just finished up with Ramadan, and you can see, you know, tens of thousands of people praying in the street, and you think, wow, huge number. Well, the reason for that in that uh, Putin has capped the number of mosques in Moscow, which is population 10 million, to four. So he just doesn't allow, right. and his mayor, Sobyanin, do not allow new mosques. Of course, they're they're opening Russian Orthodox churches like beer bottles, an inappropriate analogy, but they're all over the place. So um, Russia also suffers from a labor shortage. It has a lower unemployment rate now than the US. I think it's 2.8%. It has the lowest unemployment rate since the collapse of communism. Why? Because Putin is injecting trillions of rubles into the economy to force out more tanks and airplanes and missiles and rockets. And, um, and basically, if you can breathe in or out, you'll get a job in a Russian war factory. Now, that's one reason why the perpetrators of this attack at the Moscow City Concert Hall were all from Central Asia. Uh, there were four men who were the trigger men, and then there were probably eight others who were the enablers and may not have known what they just rented, they sold a car or something. Uh, but um, we have not seen a pogrom against the Tajiks and the Uzbeks, um, partly because the government has not encouraged it. And, and Putin, one of his speeches just two or three days ago said, well, these couldn't have been, you know, uh, Islamic radicals attacking us because we follow interfaith harmony. Uh, ha, ha, ha. 
Um, but what they really is, they, they need those Tajiks. There's one economic estimate that they're short of 4 million people, uh, workers. So they really need these people. And there's just so far they'll go to shoot themselves in the foot by deporting them or whatever. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, there's um, a question here related to uh, Kaliningrad. And the question is, are Poles especially afraid of what could happen in relation to Poland because potential mistreatment of Russians in the enclave of Kaliningrad uh, could be used as an excuse for going to war? Yeah, a good question. Uh, Kaliningrad is my favorite exclave, not an enclave, it's an exclave, which means it's outside. And um, it is, Belarus is a satellite of Russia. And there's something called the Suwaki Gap, which is maybe about a 90 mile gap between Belarus and Kaliningrad. And then on one side is Poland, the other side is Lithuania. And those who are history buffs may recall the Polish-Lithuanian confederation of the 1700s. So the Poles and Lithuanians have very good relations. Um, and the dictator of Belarus, the self-appointed president, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, made sure he was videotaped and publicized, demanding his regional commander, show me how we take the Suwaki gap. Now, Lukashenko has played a very cautious game. He's refused, refused to put his troops into this uh, battle. Um, but you can rest assured that that is why Poland is building a million man and woman army. Um, Belarus has, has played the, the immigration game of kind of bringing people from Somalia and Syria and sort of shoving across the border. The Poles uh, push that back. Um, Kaliningrad, there's a separatist movie there. Kaliningrad, if they're left to their own devices, would like to be the fourth Baltic. Uh, now they're all Russian speakers. Uh, it's no longer Königsberg, uh, but um, it's heavily military. Probably about a third of the population depends on the military. And that's why this <clears throat> ship that was burned yesterday was home ported in Kaliningrad. And they have a big Navy base there. So, um, Putin doesn't want to lose his last foothold in the Baltic, uh, except for St. Petersburg. Uh, but he's stretched pretty thin. I mean, I can't see him uh, doing anything. And frankly, the man is turning, well, he's already 70. Uh, I don't know how much oomph he has in him to invade more countries. Uh, and, and he really blew it so, stumbled so severely on this uh, Ukrainian special military operation that I think he, he may threaten, but I don't see him moving um, to take that gap, connect Belarus with Kaliningrad. Okay, uh, there are a number of questions here with regard to NATO. Uh, and uh, one of them, um, I think this has to do with the election of a new president in Slovakia. Uh, what influence do pro-Putin leaders have in NATO countries and in the um, decisions around uh, funding for the war in Ukraine? Yeah, there was another, there's an odd article in the time, New York Times saying um, the election of the new president of Slovakia strengthens the pro-Russian sentiment in Eastern Europe. It's like there are two countries that are pro-Russia. One is obviously Hungary and Slovakia is, is sort of in that camp. Poland, as I just said, is definitely not. Czech, as I just said, is definitely not. Romania is building the largest NATO base, period. Romania is building the largest NATO base, period. It has three other bases for NATO. Uh, Bulgaria just sent 50 armored personnel carriers to uh, Ukraine. Um, so I, I don't, you know, all of a sudden everyone's, you know, concerned about Slovak politics, which is nice. I think everyone's just focused on small countries. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's it's half of Czechoslovakia. It's not a big deal. It's like four million people. And uh, and these elections were like, you know, 52 to 48, that kind of thing. So um, the mouse will not roar. Okay. 
Um, there's there are some questions also about internal um, arrangements and politics within um, Ukraine. Uh, and one of the questions is um, with uh, Zelensky's changes in the uh, leadership of the uh, Ukrainian military, and especially the removal of a number of generals, um, what um, uh, what might that what impact might that have? Uh, and a related question is. Um, uh, how is Ukraine paying for this war? Yeah, not not easily. Um, yeah, the military shakeup. Uh, it's funny. In in uh, February, I gave a talk to the Palm Beach pundits. I was literally two miles from Mar-a-Lago, so that was a fun audience. And uh, the military guy says, "Well, what about the shakeup?" And I, a retired military guy, and I said, "Well, I don't think you were fighting for Colin Powell. I think you were fighting for the USA, right?" And, uh, and I think it's the same thing here. Um, I have a good friend who's a retired U.S. military, um, U.S. Marine colonel in, in Kiev. And he said, you know, um, Zaluzhny may have been charismatic and popular, but he, he launched the failed offensive last summer, last summer. If you turn our clock back one year, we all were geared up for this big offensive that, that they just kind of fell on their face, did not work. Uh, so I think the Ukrainians are fighting for their country. Uh, frankly, I think if if the Russians succeed in uh, assassinating Zelensky, which they've obviously been trying for two and a half years, um, the, you know, the Ukrainians are their guiding mythology is that they're Cossacks, they're self-starters, they're autonomous, they're sometimes anarchists. Um, they're not following some guy on white horseback. Um, they they're they're very independent, which makes them good at small unit warfare. Um, how is Ukraine paying for this? Not well. Um, I think a lot of people, I, I just read that uh, Japan is the third largest funder of Ukraine. Uh, I think it was $17 billion um, given and committed. Uh, Japan does not want to see Russia win because they've got their own problem with the Northern Territories, the Kurila Islands. It would be a green light to China to attack Taiwan. Um, so this Lend-Lease idea is a fig leaf to keep some Republicans happy. Uh, and there was a Senator Vandenberg in 1940 who was a similar Republican isolationist, you know, and he said, um, this is a loan, this Lend-Lease alone that never be repaid and we're leasing equipment we'll never see again. He was entirely true, but that fig leaf, that little label lend lease, it was much more palatable than a gift or a, you know, a donation. So um, if the lend lease to Ukraine happens, we will not see those Jeeps and APCs coming back. Um, maybe we'll see the money. Um, but so much of Europe has decided Ukrainians are doing the dirty work for us. They are keeping the Russian bear at bay and knocking out a lot of his teeth. And so they, um, for the moment, are willing to pay for it. I didn't bring up Macron. Macron is a very, the president of France, is a very interesting case because he was kind of humiliating. Well, yeah, he said, let's not humiliate uh, Putin. Let's talk. And the war started February 22 of 2022. And February 20, he called Putin and said, look, hold off, don't do it, don't do it. And someone leaked a recording Macron high-fiving his uh, advisors, his aides, saying, well, I persuaded him not to invade Ukraine. <laughs> it's really embarrassing to have that on you know, French radio <laughs> the day after the invasion. And um, so Macron is the one who said, yes, we may put French boots on the ground. Now, what he's really probably talking about are, are advisors and trainers and these sort of people. Um, and he has said all excess equipment will now go from the French army to Ukraine instead of going to Northern Africa, which was sort of a waste of money, frankly. Um, so the and, and the French foreign minister, I mean, I, I'm sure many of you on the line have had contact with French people, especially diplomats. They can be very diplomatic. The French foreign minister yesterday said, 
we're not going to waste our time talking to the Russian officials. They only lie. That's from a French diplomat, French foreign minister saying that publicly. You know, he's not saying that over a glass to Perno somewhere. He's so. Okay. Um Good. Uh, there's uh, there are a couple of related questions. Uh, one is um, how much land has um, Ukraine lost uh, during this winter campaign? Um, um, a second angle of this is that with the um, additional ammunition that's being put together mm. by the president of the Czech Republic and by other um European NATO members, um, how quickly can that get there? And um, will it make a difference in what Russia is hoping, uh, hoping to do with an offensive campaign uh, come May? Well, um, around February 15, which is about two months ago, uh, the Russians finally took Avdivka, um, and they did it with these glide bombs that have like 500 pounds of TNT. And um, just to back up a little bit, about five years ago when there was no big invasion, I tried to go to Avdivka. I was with a Canadian friend who wanted to go watch a hockey game, typical Canadian entertainment. So I just got a cab and tried to drive to the front and got ding, 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 up to um, the last checkpoint. And um, I could hear the shelling and I, I saw sort of batteries maneuvering in a field. And I, after being on car for a long time, got out to take a leak and looked down and said, mines, <laughs> I didn't blow myself to bits uh, answering call of nature. But um, that was five years ago. So the Russians and Ukrainians have been fighting over Avdivka for um, 10 years, really, since the big invasion of 2010. Um, What's interesting, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, two months have passed, and the Russians really haven't moved that far. Yeah, they, they've, they've got a few more villages you've never heard of, and but they're losing huge numbers of people. I mean, I'm not kidding, seven, 800 men a day and 10, 15 tanks a day. Just get on the internet and you, you see these tanks blowing up, being blown up by drones. What they do is the drone, you see the drone, and then the connection is cut off because the drone has exploded, but they have a drone overhead, a reconnaissance drone, and you can see the wonderful explosion. They call them pop tops when the top of the tank goes off and ends up in the field. So um, basically two months, very little progress. Um, to answer the first question, I think before the war started, if you add Crimea and half of the Donbass, Russia controlled about 15%, now it controls 20%. I think the bottom line is they control maybe 20% of the land area of Ukraine, which might be, I don't know, 7% of the population or something. Um, but, you know, they want it back for what it's worth. Okay. Ukraine and is the most heavily mined country in the world today. So that is not going to be really great uh, farming land for a while. Yeah. Um um, I'm going to interject a question of my own here, and that is that um, um, I've been reading in a number of sources that these special units um, that that the Ukrainian military is allowing some of these special units that are a little more nimble uh, to um, be engaged uh in in the on the front uh with the russians to try to minimize the number of ukrainians killed and maximize the number of russians um do you see this slight change of approach uh as um being something that could um continue uh, should there be um uh, an offense in may well it, once again, it looks like the Russians are pushing forward kind of the cannon fodder to draw fire, and then they know what are the firing positions of the Ukrainians, and they don't care if they lose 20 men in operation like that. Um, Ukraine has its own personnel problem that people have been fighting for two years, and a lot of guys have been killed, and women, 
Um, so uh, they're trying to minimize casualties, of course. What I find interesting is that they are, they're always thinking, they're always innovating, you know, I mean, to blow up a ship in the Baltic, you know, who would have thought of that? Uh, to attack 15 oil refineries, to go to the source of the Suhoi bombers and attack three um, air bases. Um, I think they're, they're always are innovating and trying to figure out, you know, where is the Russian Achilles heel? Where can we weaken them? Uh, and they, they suffered greatly through these um, glide bombs, which um, just is like made of Divka look like Stalingrad. I mean, just blew the place up. Okay. Um, there are um, a number of questions about um, the F-16s that have now been released uh, from um, NATO allies um, and that can be sent on to Ukraine. And a question about um, whether those planes might make a difference at this point and what the difference could be. Well, I think the F-16 is seen as a better uh, than the Suhoi, you know, 24, 25, 35. But the Russians have been training on these Suhois for you know, tens of years, decades. And the Ukrainian pilots are new with the F-16. And unfortunately, some of the best Ukrainian pilots are now dead. So um, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, it will help. It may push... Um, Sohoi's back. Um, there's a very interesting thing, which, you know, once again, I don't know, the New York Times coverage just misses these things, but there was a, <clears throat> after Avdivka, the Sohoi's came in, and in 13 days, the Ukrainians shot down 13 Sohoi's. And they did that by moving the Patriots way up and taking a risk. And then at the end of 13 days, the Russians found them and uh, hit them with an Iskander missile and uh, took out two Patriot batteries. But um, the idea is to push the Sohoi's back. Um, I would wager that the F-16s will go into Russian airspace. I mean, you know, the um, Russians have been all over Ukrainian airspace. Um, and these aren't total gifts. I mean, it's kind of like or a gift from us because we're selling all these countries. There are about 100 F-16s that are in the pipeline to go to Ukraine. And then we're selling them the latest generation. I think they're F-35s, um, which are hotter and newer. So um, yes, Holland and all these countries are giving F-16s to Ukraine um, and training them. Uh, so but once again, not a, not a silver bullet. OK. Uh, there's a question here. Does Russia have the ability to rebuild its armament supply in the short term or is it a long term venture? Um, and um, that's I also read uh, last week that um, a lot of the computer chips that have been sold to Russia in the last year have been sold from U.S. and European um suppliers so wondering how um that can happen given the um economic um sanctions that are in place yeah the sanctions have proved to be pretty leaky on all fronts uh trade with uh, turkey spiked trade with china doubled um i think there's I'm reading about Chinese banks refusing to deal with Russia. Um, and uh, I'm getting the sense that there's more, the controls are starting to stick. Um, answer the question long-term, short-term, I think medium-term. And, and this is why I think that the idea of Russia attacking a NATO country, like basically trying to take out the Baltics, which would be the easy one, um, unfortunately. Um, they need to rebuild. And um, they really haven't gotten much materiel from China. Um, now, there's some thought, I think the Biden administration is warning that China is supporting more, but basically the Chinese support is they, they buy the oil at a discount. Um, they bought a lot of stuff, something like 
I think the South Koreans say they bought like 5,000 container loads from of arms, largely um, missiles, um, artillery shells from North Korea and these ballistic missiles. Um, there isn't a lot of Soviet standard, Soviet gauge. So the, the India, India has a lot, but they, they don't want to give it away. They're, they're thinking about China and Pakistan. Um, We've tried to buy stuff from places like uh, Peru and Ecuador uh, to help the Ukrainians with mixed results. But um, so far, I think the Russian war industries are untouched. It would just take time to produce enough to start another invasion somewhere. Okay. Um, there are... Um... A number of questions here um, having to do with um, the potential for Ukraine in the coming season to um, move uh, into areas of the Donbass, potentially move into Crimea. Do you see that um, happening or uh, is that something for the future? Yeah, something for the future. I, I don't think that Ukraine is in any shape to do an offensive. Um, but being on the defensive, you know, traditionally you is three to one, three offenders, three attackers killed for every defender. But the Ukrainians claim that in places like Bakhmut and others, that it was like seven to one. They were slaughtering large numbers of Russian soldiers. So they're busy digging trenches, uh, and uh, Zelensky has been visiting the trenches and um, around Kharkiv. Um, and Russia's basically said, we're going to take over Kharkiv, the second largest city. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I think Ukraine is now in a defensive crouch, let's put it that way. And it could be very profitable for them. Um, you know, the glory days of the first year where they expel the invaders from Kyiv, from Kharkiv, from Kherson. I, I don't see that happening. Both sides have their trenches. Um, and then you get into what's the end game. And frankly, most Ukrainians really are not that anxious to see Donbass returned. Crimea they want. Everyone wants Crimea. OK. Um... Thank you. There are a number of questions here about Putin, um, whether Putin uh, is grooming a successor, um, how strong is Putin's support within the Russian population? So um, could you comment on uh, the reading the tea leaves uh, from the recent election from um the decision to um, get rid of Navalny um, right before the election. Um, so where do you see Mr. Putin at this point? Well, he's pretty secure as a dictator can be secure. Uh, he controls all TV, radio, internet, and um, what's left of print media. Um, and people have been bombarded with this stuff for, for a long time. Um, but then, you know, if you're a Russian and the phone rings, cell phone, whatever, you know, do you support President Putin? Yeah, sure, of course I do. I don't know who you are. But, <laughs> but uh, if, then the second question is, you know, if Putin um, declared an armistice and freezing troops in place, would you accept that? And like 85% said yes. Uh, so people... I think the Russians are not really on some big, the Russian people are not on some big imperialist jag. Um, now, in terms of successor, there's no known successor. Uh, people have joked it could be his daughter, but I don't see that. Um, he has two daughters. Um, I There are a lot of people who think they should be, but he, he's really surrounded by this nomenclatura. These men... Uh, the man who runs the FSB and the other, they're both 72 years old. You know, they all were trained, educated, and started their careers in the Soviet era, and many of them at the KGB. So they're yesterday's men, uh, and 
that was kind of the tragedy about Navalny. And he was 45 and, and was the, the, the man to lead Russia in the generational turn. Uh, there, there, I think there's some sons of ministers who figure that they should be the next president. Uh, but it's obviously political death to say that in public. Uh, and and Putin, for a man of his age, is in pretty good shape, you know. So he may be with us for another ten years. That said, would an eighty-year-old man invade another country? I don't think so. Seventy-three, yes, maybe. But you know, after a while, guys kind of lose steam. Okay. Um... No offense to the eighty-year-olds out there. I'm sure you'd love to invade countries. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's a question here about um, the uh, Putin's aggressive comments, uh, his um, nuclear saber rattling uh, in relation to NATO countries. Uh, and but there's a question: um, why why would he attack a NATO country when he could attack Moldova instead? Well, he can't quite get to Moldova because it's surrounded by Ukraine and Romania. Um, the, the nuclear issue is really important, obviously. Um, I think, you know, we've relearned going back to the, the brinkmanship textbooks that our parents dealt with in the fifties and sixties and seventies. Um, you know, basically if someone threatens to use a nuclear weapon, we can't say, Oh, okay. You know, we'll let you take Taiwan or something. So there has to be a certain amount of negotiation standoff um nuclear weapons are best kept in their holster not used once they're used uh and i think putin understands this it's end game um for him and for his family um that said putin was irrational in uh attacking ukraine um there was not much support for that domestically it was like u.s attacking canada like why do that um, so he's been irrational in the recent past. He's surrounded by some pretty extremist people and he's been fed some bad information. Um, I mean, like the guys who, who are going around saying it was the Ukrainians who sent these four Muslims to shoot up our concert hall. They're the ones who told them to invade Ukraine. You know, there was no punishment. You know, it, it's loyalty over competence. And, and these are the people he's surrounded himself with. <clears throat> okay, I think there's another question here that might be reflective of what's happening in um in Israel and Gaza and the Middle East. Um uh how does potentially ending this war or continuing the war relate to Putin's hold on power? Um so yeah, I think obviously the atrocity of October 7th and what's happened since then has been a huge distraction. Um, but I, I find what's interesting is Europe is not distracted. I mean, they obviously are focusing on what's the tragedies in the Middle East, but they, they see this as a visceral core threat to their security. Um, they're not, you know, Norway's not doubling its defense budget for the fun of it, you know. Um, so um, if there was a, there's never a solution to the Middle East, you know, if things kind of yeah. die down for the moment, um, that might allow people to focus again on Ukraine. I, I don't think the lack of focus has been that important. I mean, the global South doesn't care about Ukraine. They do care about the Mideast to some degree, uh, but you have Japan, Germany, France, Britain, um, really focused on on helping ukraine and actually the american public opinion is there it's just that this small group uh, maybe 20 percent of the republicans in the u.s house that are holding things up and may succeed in holding things up okay uh there's a question here um, um i'm gonna restate this a little bit um and that is um what is the world doing about putin's war crimes uh, and is there more that could be done? Well, he's uh, been indicted, as you probably know, by the International Court in The Hague, International Court of Justice. He and his uh, children's rights person uh, for 
uh, basically uh, kidnapping uh, Ukrainian children, you know, beefing up the Slavic gene pool. Um, the there are prosecutors and people collecting information. Uh, a lot of the Russians have left. Russian soldiers have left. So digital traces. So we know pretty much who did the killing in Bucha, which was the really turning point atrocity. That was a northern Kiev suburb where I've been several times. In the past, it was a lovely park-like place. Um, so the records are being kept. Uh, there is international support there. And um, I think it's sunk through. You know, there was a on one of these talk shows on Russian state TV, one of these Saturday night shows watched by 50 million people, um, one of the panelists said, well, you know, we're all going to go, um, we'll all go on trial in London after when this is all over. And the host, uh, Sobolyov, who's a Kremlin propagandist, said, trial in London? London's going to be wiped out by a tsunami of nuclear ash. I mean, this is the kind of kooky stuff that is going out there, which is dangerous because it, it lowers the threshold for. And earlier in the talk show, he said, um, oh, the French mayor won't let uh, Russian athletes parade in the Summer Olympics in June in Paris. Well, maybe we'll just drop a couple of nuclear bombs on her, you know. And um, um, and frankly, when we invaded and camped out in Paris in 1820. We didn't ask permission. You know, this is the kind of aggressive, kooky stuff that um, is not considered kooky by television producers in Moscow. Um, okay, um, and there there are a number of questions here about um, uh, what Biden could do. Um, what Biden could do to get uh, Congress to move on Ukrainian aid. Um, what is the difference between Biden and Trump in this area? And um, and how disastrous would it be if Trump were um, elected uh, in November for, yeah. for Ukraine? Well, I think... Biden's been fairly good. I mean, he really rallied the troops. The administration did the early part of the war. I think the critique is that he didn't move fast and hard enough to allow um, Ukraine to win uh, when it had the Russians on the back foot. And I think the feeling is that maybe Biden doesn't really want Ukraine to win. It's kind of messy. Um, but the U.S. has given an enormous amount of aid. Now, the interesting question is what happens if Trump wins uh, seven months from now? Um, I think uh, it's interesting what's happened with these warnings that Trump has given. Trump has a pinched nerve about Ukraine. He believes that Ukraine was behind uh, the Russia hearings in the, um, in the House and that Ukraine is evil and bad and corrupt, you know, unlike Russia. Um, so he really hates Ukraine. I mean, it's this has come out from his advisors, you know, and uh, but by kind of wearing his emotions on this, his sleeve, the Europeans have woken up. And I, I hate to tell Americans, but really, it may not be our call on whether Ukraine lives or dies. Um, I think the Europeans do not want a Russian victory in Ukraine. And they are moving surprisingly fast and hard. So we may be, Trump could, President Trump this time next year could be huffing and puffing and threatening, but, uh, and, and chumming it up with Putin, but the Europeans may just dig in their heels more. And you can say, oh, Europeans, you know, that's not a big deal. Europe has like, you know, Russia has the, has the economy of Italy, you know, which is a big economy, but, you know, the EU is a heavyweight. The EU is equal to the US in GDP. And it's their turf. It's their continent. And uh, now they're little, they're playing catch up and they're behind, but I think they've woken up to the threat. And um, so the you, you a President Trump a year from now may be threatening and having 
little meetings with Putin and declaring he'd end the war in a day and all this silliness, but it may not be up to the U.S. anymore, which is quite a change for the last 75 years when we, with the Marshall Plan and NATO, were sort of rebuilt Europe and we were the, the guarantors of Europe. It will be a new ball game, and it will probably be a messy one. And the negotiations uh, last week about uh, shifting control of the the sort of coalition supporting Ukraine from being U.S. controlled to being NATO controlled. Uh, sure. Do you see that as part of that? Oh, uh, Catherine, very clearly, very clearly part of that. There's a lot of preemptive moves being taken, you know, what if Trump is elected, you know, and it's interesting that uh, foreign minister of the UK, Cameron, went to Florida and met with Trump. I, I doubt he had much success, but he probably knew Trump from the old days. But um, yeah, no, that move inside NATO to have sort of a, uh, a European control of the, of the Ukraine aid group was sort of a bureaucratic mm -hmm. thing, but it meant that Trump couldn't sabotage it. <clears throat> well, you'd have a hard time sabotaging him. Okay. Uh, so um, I think um, there's uh, there are just two more two more questions here that are sort of outside the range of what um, you've um, talked about already. And um, that is, um, could you talk a little bit, and I know you did this in some of the earlier talks, uh, but what about the situation of the people uh, in the Donbass and in, in Crimea uh, and um, what, um, um, what do you think their feelings are in this situation and um, the is the Donbass continuing to be depopulated? Um, short answer, yes. Uh, I think the people who are now in the Russian-controlled part of the Donbass and in Crimea don't want to be part of Ukraine, most of them. Now, they're the Crimean Tatars, who are the historic people who lived there and control the peninsula until Catherine Great showed up. And... Um, they're about 15% of the population and they uh, want to be part of Ukraine. And the history is that Stalin deported them all in yeah. 1943, uh, 44. Um, and there's a group called Atesh, which means I think fire in Crimean Tatar. And they are, um, it's an open website. They're, they're providing intel on uh, where the, what's happening at the air bases and the land bases. But there's been a real settlement of, um, Russians from Russia going in. And once again, Crimea is the Florida of Ukraine and the Florida of Russia. It's a great place, was a great place to retire to. Um, but it also has a geostrategic point of view and it really controls access to the Odessa ports. The Donbass is kind of the rust belt of Ukraine. Um, and it really suffered under Russia occupation. This city of Mariupol, which Putin basically leveled, uh, there was an oligarch I knew, um, Akhmedov, who was had a plan to invest a billion dollars and was doing it. It wasn't a plan. He, he had a program of investing a billion dollars to upgrade the steel factory as off stall uh, in Mariupol to create green uh, steel that would be acceptable to the European Union. Um, and so that kind of investment just, well, now it's gonna happen because Azov Stahl was where the men held out for the very last moment. But um, Mariupol has been destroyed and, and most of the Donetsk, Luhansk areas of the Donbass are stagnant. And, um, you know, there were press gang waiters out of restaurants to join their army and uh, it, you know, I don't think, frankly, most Ukrainians are not too eager to see them back. They know that the people have been under heavy Russian propaganda for 10 years and would not want to be part of Ukraine. And um, like Crimea is a different. And then there's a third area, which is the area that was occupied by Russia in the last two years. 
um, and they want that back. Um, and um, that's the access to the seal is off, and it's the part of the hair salon. Um, Judith, I haven't called any. We do have a map. I, I neglected to. Um, here's your big moment if you're still there. Um, if you look down um, the lower part of the screen, um, the seal is off. Sort of from Mariupol over to Kherson, that area is occupied, and um, and just under Zaporizhia, and across the river Zaporizhia is the largest nuclear power complex in Europe, and that is a huge concern, especially as um, the Ukrainians suffered. I mean, do you see Chernobyl up there above Kiev? Uh, you know. Chernobyl had its meltdown and the Ukrainians suffered greatly from that. So they're very sensitive about this nuclear power complex, which is in the hand, hands of Russian soldiers. Um, so, Okay, um, there's a, a technical question here and then uh, two questions about frozen Russian assets. Uh, so the technical question is, do European uh, does the European defense industry complex um, have the capacity to produce uh, weapons that are compatible with what the U.S. is providing? Well, uh, short answer, yes, because it's all NATO standard. standard. Uh, yeah. But they enjoyed the peace benefit and, and kind of let these industries kind of fall behind. Um, but a lot of what Ukraine uses is the old Soviet stuff. So there's been this great big sucking sound of MiGs and T-54 tanks and artillery pieces that have gone from the former Warsaw Pact countries <clears throat> and gone straight to Ukraine. Um, and then the problem is finding shells for that, that stuff. But the Russian armaments industry is still pretty quite good shape, I'd say. Okay. And um, so... Um... Fro frozen Russian assets. Um, has anything changed in regard to those um, in the last well, uh, yeah, 20 I mean, days? It's about $330 billion. You know, Putin did this, <clears throat> this invasion so secretly that he didn't tell a central bank. <laughs> and they got stuck with $330 billion, uh, largely in European banks, about $7 billion in the U.S., and for this, this famous aid package to Ukraine, oh, the idea is to use some of that money. Um, right now, all the Europeans will do is they will give the interest earned to Ukraine. Now, the estimate is that Russia has caused $500 billion worth of physical damage to Ukraine, and that $330 billion would be a way of paying forward reparations, which the Russians would want to pay anyhow. Uh, and this has been, you know, Larry Summers and other people have worked out the, the legal path. We passed, the U.S. has passed enabling legislation. Um, a lot of this money is held by a, a Belgian organization, and they are reluctant to let go of it. Uh, there's a feeling this would set a bad precedent. Uh, there are precedents. I think in the Iran Iraq in the when Iraq invaded Kuwait, uh, we seized Iraqi assets. Um, so there's a strong movement to seize this money and use it for Ukraine. Uh, there's also a strong movement to not let it go. So it has not been resolved yet. I think in the US we will use the seven billion dollars or so for Ukraine aid which is only like 2%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think um, we've, I may have missed some questions here. I've tried to cluster them um, because we've had so many, um, but um, many thanks uh, to uh, you, Jim, uh, thanks to everybody who was asking questions. Uh, and uh, I uh, think that uh, in another 100 to 120 days, so before the election, uh, maybe even twice before the election, yeah. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We hope to have Jim back. Um, and um, some of these questions may come back again, but as we know, um, in a hundred days, the situation could be changed. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a work in progress. And to be fair, uh, my articles also run in the New York Sun, which is a good outlet. So um, most of them are in the Eagle, but they're also in the New York Sun. Okay, so for those of you who want to follow Jim, uh, check out the New York Sun. Um, if you're here in the Berkshires, um, subscribe to the Berkshire Eagle. And um, again, many uh, thank yous, Jim, uh, from people uh, who have uh, been online. And we will look forward to welcoming you back uh, uh, in another 100 days. Good deal. Great. Well, Catherine, thank you. And Judith and Carol, thank you also. And uh, I'll see you in three or four months. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank Good you. Night. Bye. Good night.